Okay, we're back. We're live. We're at ThinkTech here on a Monday. And we are talking about um, our expanding understanding of our expanding universe. Sounds like poetry. With Roy Gall of IFA. Hi, Roy. Thanks hey. for coming down. Thank you. Very important to have this discussion because IFA, you know, it's sui generis. It's a special category of, it's outside the campus and it has, it ranges, uh, you know, to the whole world and to the universe, <laughs> the multi-universe. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I saw your work again um, at, the, uh, at the talk by Alex Filipenko from Berkeley, is it? Yes, that's right. And the boy, he, he tells you about Berkeley. He likes Berkeley. <laughs> and who talked about, um, what was it, the Big Bang Theory and inflation, which I thought was, I thought he was going to connect it to the stock market, but he didn't do that. Yeah, maybe uh, it's, the joke is too easy. <laughs> and the, multi, the multiverse. That's right. Called yeah. it. I thought that was poetry, but no. It That's wasn't the term poetry. we use, yeah. <laughs> but first, let's talk about the environment itself and how this all happened. IFA, Woodlawn Drive, Institute for Astronomy, really strong school, in my opinion. Every time I look, I see more things that convince me of that. Tell us about IFA. So, uh, uh, as I've said before in this program, the Institute for Astronomy at uh, UH is the largest academic astronomy unit in the country. Um, we're actually an organized research unit. And we're not just on Woodlawn Drive. We have uh, a branch in Hilo and a branch in uh, Pukalani, Maui. They're all actually part of UH Manoa, oddly enough, even though they're on the other islands. And uh, we have our telescope on Mauna Kea and telescopes and on Haleakala as well. So we are really a spread out large institute, about 250 or 300 people, including all of our staff. Wow. So, and we do everything in astronomy. I mean, that's uh, maybe, it's very rare actually among astronomy programs because we're so big, we do everything from planets in our solar system, minor planets, uh, near earth objects, asteroids, the sun, to our local universe, to the biggest cosmology. <laughs> we do. <laughs> what we study. What we study. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we study those things. We search for those things. We build instruments to study those things. So um, we do. We perform all, all the parts of research. We train graduate students, and actually, hopefully, this fall we're starting our undergraduate program at UH Manoa. Finally. Mm-hmm. Um, but you've been offering courses to undergraduates. We've been offering introductory undergraduate courses and a few higher level courses, but our majors uh, should start this fall. Yeah. So join us. Well, I, you know, uh, by the way, um, the, are, you, are you completely part of the university? We are. Or do you have connections outside the university that gives you a little lift somehow? So we are completely, the Institute for Astronomy is what's called an organized research unit, which is just one way of uh, defining a component of the university. Um, but what we have is because of the telescopes that are built, uh, especially on Mauna Kea, uh, part of the time on the observing time of those telescopes comes to the state of Hawaii and th therefore to UH Institute for Astronomy. So the big leg up that we have on a lot of places is that we have access to these observatories that not only that we build, but that others build and others make that huge investment here. And uh, we get gain access to that, which is, which is unique. You are then, you are the the local academic face, voice, organization that speaks to Mauna Kea. Yet in, all in those telescopes are in your ambit. Uh, yes and no. So the summit is under the Office of Mauna Kea Management, which actually is part of UH Hilo, because they manage the land there and who can build, who can't build, making sure the conservation, the cultural aspects are all taken care of. So from that standpoint, it's uh, not the IFA's responsibility anymore. Maybe it's a good thing. Uh, actually, it was, it's a good to separate that because as the users of the observatories and as the builders of some of them and participants in many of them, um, it's, it's good to have a little separation. Um, but uh, we do benefit from all those observatories and we are partners in some of them like the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope. We now sit on the board of the Keck Telescope. Um, in some telescopes, we have own, we basically just receive a share of the observing time, and we're less of a partner. And in others, we build cameras for them and are more involved. So it's a complete mix. So because of the telescopes and Mauna Kea and Hawaii's uh, extraordinary leadership, you know, by virtue of its environment uh, in this area, you you become very important in the worldwide community of uh, astronomy, right? That that's. That's true. I don't. I don't want to overemphasize our role. No, and I, I would. want to just. Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I don't want to also leave out Haleakala, where, for instance, the world's largest solar telescope is being built by the U.S. right now, um, and for which one of our 
astronomers is building one of the first light cameras, so we're a big part of that as well. Um, and where PanStars, which is an Institute for Astronomy project, is located. Um, but we, we are part of the greatest concentration of astronomical resources in the world, which is here in Hawaii. And uh, so we, we simply, I would say, we benefit from that. We try to leverage that to our own uh, advantage, sure. of course. And to the advantage of the state, it brings a lot of investment to something like two-thirds of the Institute for Astronomy's budget is extramural funds. That's so, what I was um, going to ask you about. Uh, well, we, coming from where? Uh, federal grants, for the most part, um, and a little bit of private funds as well. Um, so uh, all of our astronomers try to write grant proposals. Uh, things like the PanStars uh, telescopes we're bringing in uh, at their peak uh, of order $10 million a year for their op construction operation. And it's not like that money just goes into the pockets of the astronomers or into the building telescope. Every grant has an overhead associated with it, which goes into the operating budget of the institute, but is also somewhat spread throughout the university. And so, and of course, anything that increases the university's, I don't know, uh, luminosity, uh, brightness is, per, is good for the perfect word yes. for an astronomer yes. to use. That's why, that's why I came to mind. So, but if, um, you know, it, <clears throat> we have these consortia, I thought about that word, yeah. so, uh, who build these telescopes, that's and right. they, uh, they have billions, or at least uh, when I, you know, heard about uh, thir the 30 meter telescope, yeah, about, they had. about one and a half billion will be the total so budget. This, uh, the, do they make special grants to you, or do you get involved in their, you know, in their, um, you know, their money flow? Uh, this is complicated, and I don't know the details of the 30 meter telescope or TMT budget. So there is some money flow that comes directly to the state of Hawaii because they're spending over a million dollars a year on doing like public education and K through 12 programs and things like that. Um, there money is their own to spend and actually if we would like to be a partner in that we would either have to beyond the time that we're receiving uh, on the telescope for it being built on Mauna Kea uh, we would actually have to contribute uh, beyond that but that could be a contribution not of just cash but we could be building cameras or sure. in kind whatever in kind is. contributions yeah, and things yeah. like that. so that is in discussion right now yeah. of how we could contribute more we would like to actually become a full partner in the sense that we're not just uh, told, okay, you get X percentage of the observing time, um, but that we actually have a say in what the, s beyond that, what the science is that's being done, what the uh, instruments that are being built that allows us to strengthen and develop our own programs via the TMT as a mechanism. Well, it's to wonderful that. to be in science, you know. Science essentially is so civilized, isn't it? Uh, sure, <laughs> i say so. <laughs> okay, well, let's hope it is anyway. <laughs> You know, one of, the, one of the other things is you have, you have um, faculty, research staff from all over the world. They come here to, you know, bathe uh, in, the, in, the, in Mauna Kea, I guess, and Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea and, and Haleakala. Hale um, and, I mean, Gun Gunther Hassinger, yes, our for director. example, he's an he's a international name, isn't he? That's right. So he was a director of a large uh, institute for plasma physics in uh, Germany before he came to us as our director. And actually, our previous director, Rolf Kudritsky, is also happens to be German. Yes. But we have uh, astronomers from all over the U.S. and all over the world, uh, including our graduate students and postdocs. So from many Asian countries, uh, many South American countries, many European countries. Um, so it's a very... Uh, a diverse uh, group of people. Actually, astronomy in general is an incredibly international endeavor. You think of, like you were talking about, the partnerships on Mauna Kea. The Canada-France-Hawaii telescope, the 30-meter telescope, has partners from California, from India, Japan, China. Subaru is Japan's national it's observatory, it's so it's, it's all over. It's great, and, but you have to appreciate that because those those relationships are not automatic. They have to be worked. They if have they to be work, negotiated. They have to be negotiated with it. <laughs> and sometimes things like bringing China into a project, right, has its own political and economic issues. Um, having many international groups have their own rules. I know, for instance, Japan has rules about what you can and can't buy, so they have to rent the vehicles that they use at Subaru, I believe, instead of buying them outright or something like that, you know. So everyone has their own governmental regulations and rules and laws to deal with. And bringing that all together in the name of doing the best science at the best site in the world is, you know, well, it's a struggle, good, it's a good experience. It. You know, I mean, to me, this makes Hawaii sophisticated. It makes Hawaii global. It makes, it makes IFA and anybody around IFA part of an international, you know, community, which is a good thing for sure. 
It is, and I would like to add, I mean, we get many international visitors, tourists coming to Waikiki or to Maui or wherever, to Kona, um, and they bring a different kind of global perspective. They're here to enjoy a little of what Hawaii has to offer, um, often not, not even realizing everything that the state has to offer. But the people who are coming here as scientists, they live here, they become part of the community, they take that community back home with them uh, if they move back home, and it really spreads a different kind of aloha um, to, to the scientific community around the world, I think. Great thing to have, which, I mean, uh, this isn't uh, part of our show today, but that always makes me wonder why anybody would oppose this or um, oppose the extension of our science, but that's another show. Someone else, yeah. Okay, the other thing I wanted to talk about is education. You know, you mentioned that TMT, I guess, and others in the astronomy business spent a lot of money on public education. And indeed, I went to your open house uh, yes. at, at IFA about a month ago or so. Yeah, April 6th that was. I was very impressed. I was impressed with what you did and how it comported with the school and, you know, how it, sort of everything came together in this, like, you know, bristling with interesting information kind of experience. And the kids, I love the kids. They were all there. And, Everybody said, you know, I always wanted to be an astronomer. I love astronomy. <laughs> Why? I didn't know that so many people are closet astronomers. Oh, That's what you find. It's unbelievable. Actually, we, uh, um, you know, as the person who coordinates the open house, I'm happy to hear uh, uh, those kind words. And actually, it was a very successful open house. It's become more and more family oriented. This year, we had quite a few new exhibitors. And what we found this year is because we had new exhibits and we had lots of families coming, they stayed a long time and they really enjoyed a lot of the different things they were to learn. And yes, I think everyone is almost a closet astronomer. Everyone looks up and wonders what's going on out there. And often astronomy is seen as, as the gateway science to getting people interested into careers in science, technology, engineering, math, the STEM fields. And we are well aware of that. Um, and other sciences and other people are well aware of that. So we see that as sort of our duty or obligation um, to creating a, you know, a good civilized society that's educated and that understands how things works, work and how they, we can move ourselves forward with new technologies and new, science, new understandings of the world around us. So we take that very seriously. And we don't just spend a lot of money on it. We spend a lot of time on it, a lot of volunteer hours uh, from our students and faculty and staff and all the observatories do as well because it's, it's important and the community wants it and we think it's, it needs oh, to be fulfilled. That was clear on Open House. I mean, those kids yeah. loved it. In fact, those people loved it. I mean, I yeah. met an old friend of mine, the guy's in his late 70s, early 80s, and you couldn't keep him away from Open House with wild horses. Oh, yeah. I mean, he loves it. We it's get lots very of important. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, on that point, I, I went Friday to uh, Keala K. Hay uh, High School yep. in, in Kona, Mauka. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really something. I, I was so surprised. Big high school, active high school, yeah. very, very, um, what's the word, elegant high school, really. I mean, those kids were really good kids. The faculty was really devoted to them. The whole thing was a good experience. But you tell me that you guys are over there. You're doing stuff over there. Yeah, well, we do. Uh, well, the observatories uh, and the Institute for Astronomy have a Mauna Kea Astronomy Outreach Committee that uh, serves especially Hawaii Island place. Uh, residents and we're working on actually expanding more of our services on the Kona side. Um, but uh, uh, two years ago I went to Kealakehe, it was funny that you said that, uh, I was like, oh, that's a school I know well, because we did a teacher training workshop in uh, science and math. It was a weekend workshop, two days, and we had about a dozen teachers come and we showed them inquiry-based, you know, interactive ways to teach some physics and math, some of it using astronomy, um, and that was us and uh, folks from the Super M uh, program from the math department at UH. And we actually, in order to get young teachers to come, we provided daycare for their kids. So the kids got astronomy activities during the day while the parents, the teachers, got to uh, learn more about teaching. And last year and this year, we're supporting a program. The, one of their teachers, Justin Brown, who I believe is the head of their robotics program, a very successful robotics program, runs a STEM camp uh, about a week in June and every day it's a different field, and June 4th will be Astronomy Day. So Gemini Observatory, us, Keck Observatory, um, and others will be providing activities for 72 third to fifth graders and 72 sixth to eighth graders. And the uh, West Hawaii Astronomy Club will be doing stargazing that night. So to try to 
you know, just pique some interest, go deeper than what you get in the classroom, have hands-on activities um, with sort of tools that might not be available to a typical classroom, and they have geologists on another day, and I think oceanographers on another day. So to really show not just the science, but what's going on in Hawaii. Where could you go with a, a career in astronomy or geology or oceanography or science in general? Those kids are wonderful. I <clears throat> interviewed three of them, and uh, they were patriotic to the state, if I may <laughs> say that. And also very you know, curious, excitable, all kinds of good sensibilities. Yeah. And I know they'd be interested in this and in Maybe science. Maybe they'll be there. Yeah. Uh, they probably will. Uh, that's Roy Gall. Uh, he's uh, with IFA. You're what, an associate professor? Assistant professor. Assistant yeah. professor. Um, and this is Think Tech, and we're talking about our expanding understanding of our expanding universe. We'll be right back after this short break. Hello, I'm Martin Despang, and I'm the host, together with the one and only Ali Amashta, and our show is called Urban Transcendence. And urban transcendence is about identifying where we have a unique situation of a vibrant city in one of the most beautiful natural environments. So how these two can coincide, sometimes conflict, how they could find reciprocity in the 21st century is what we're excited about. And we're planning on bringing in a diverse body of, of guests both from the arts and the science and the established and the wise and the emerging generation. So hope you will join us. We'll always be on on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech Talks. We're talking about our expanding uh, understanding of our expanding universe uh, with Roy Gall of IFA, the Institute for Astronomy at UH Manoa, actually on Woodlawn Drive. So uh, what, two weeks ago, uh, you guys invited, as you do from time to time, yes. um, big names in astronomy. You invited Alex Filipenko from Berkeley, yes. UC Berkeley, come around and give a speech. And he titled that speech, uh, The Big Bang Theory, which I really didn't know too much about. And um, uh, then it was inflation, which I yeah. thought had something to do with uh, the stock market. And um, then it was the, multi, the multiverse, which I thought was something with poetry. Um, <laughs> And um, it was really not like that. It was way over my head. Oh, I tried to stay focused. Yeah. I brought an exchange lawyer from Shanghai with me, mm -hmm. and she tried to stay focused. Um, and she had some science background because all the lawyers in China have science oh, background. You know. um, and he was, he was a fabulous speaker. He was really a yep. TED-quality TED speaker. So can you tell us a little about Alex Filipenko and, and uh, you know, what he means to the world of astronomy? I know he's a member of the National Academy yep. of Science, which doesn't come easy. Yeah. yeah. So Alex uh, came as a part of our Explorers of the Universe talk series, which I do want to give a shout out to uh, Sheraton Waikiki, which uh, sponsors that series for us. And the whole point is to bring people who are well known and whose names are recognized and who also do great work. So we had Brian Schmidt uh, as our first speaker two years ago who won a Nobel Prize um, for being part, a leader of one of the teams that discovered the accelerating expansion of the universe through supernovae. And the reason I brought that person up is because Alex Filipenko was part of Brian Schmidt's team. He was also part of the other team that won that same Nobel Prize. In fact, I believe he's the only astronomer who was on both teams. So Alex Filipenko, is, his primary expertise is in the supernovae or the stars that explode um, at their death and which we can see far across the universe. And so he's done a lot of the important uh, seminal work in that field. And that's where most of his expertise comes from. But unlike many astronomers who uh, do this incredible kind of work, He's not just uh, doing this great science, he's also an amazing speaker, as you said, and an amazing teacher. So he can really communicate these concepts in a way that many people can't. So he has won the UC Berkeley like Top Professor Award for nine years in a row, which is also not easy to do. They must um, love him there. They do love him, and he lectures to, in introductory astronomy is one of the things he teaches, to large, sold out, shall we say, you know, overbooked uh, lecture halls and uh, really doesn't just convey the ideas in a way that you can understand, but I think even more importantly possibly to really introductory astronomy classes where you have people who aren't going to go on to science careers, is he conveys the passion and the curiosity. And that's what we really would like people who might not be experts in the sciences to go away with is go, oh, this is worthwhile, this is cool, this is interesting. 
So I want to support astronomy. It's not just a bunch of people staring through big telescopes um, doing exotic stuff. There's really amazing stuff, some of which has very interesting impacts on our lives and the way we think. And Alex is great at conveying that. So It's also funny. Yeah. He made a very clear distinction between cosmology, which is his field, and cosmetology, yeah. which is uh, 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 facials and yeah. hairdressing. I, when he made that joke, which was like his opening line, actually I, I <laughs> was very amused because when I was an undergraduate student at Columbia, my advisor, I did research there, he had a sign on his door that actually came from a textbook publisher, and the packaging said, Department of Cosmetology, and it was sent to him in the astronomy department. And you know that's that's a real bad faux pas. You're probably not going to get a textbook from that publisher after that. But uh, you know, nothing to do with each other. <laughs> well, you know, it struck me also that uh, you know we might have uh, assumed from our early days that um, astronomy has a lot to do with stars in the sky and far away universes, and you know what we saw in um, in and Captain Kirk, <laughs> okay, but it's also physics. It's he all was physics. talking about. Yeah, I didn't realize that until he spoke. There's a there's a kind of a gag, if you want to call it that, which is that basically astronomy is just physics, and physics is just chemistry, and chemistry is just biology, or something <laughs> like that. So um, maybe the other way around. Anyway, the um, but really, what we're trying to do, astronomy started out as going out and looking at the patterns of the motions of the stars, of the planets, when people realized that the planets were distinct, of the seasons. And that's really classical astronomy. And even today when people say, I'm an astronomer, those are usually the people who use telescopes and take data and try to measure about the universe. We want to understand, but in order to understand, you first have to measure. And then we bring in the physics, which it comes from Newton and uh, Herschel and all these other people who contributed to trying to understand why those motions are the way they are. Why do things look the way they do? How do we understand the underlying principles? And so that's where we are today is we're trying to measure but also get to these underlying principles. So the supernova experiments of which Alex was a, a major player are a great example of this. We know, so the whole idea with the supernovae is if you know how bright a light bulb is, then if you put it at different distances, it looks fainter and fainter. If you measure how bright it looks and you know what its actual luminosity the light it gives off is, you can immediately calculate the distance. You don't even need calculus. This is a simple algebra division and you know, uh, simple math that uh, our sixth graders can do. Well, in the universe, we want to measure distances, but we don't have rulers long enough. So you want to find brighter and brighter light bulbs that you know what their wattage is. And these exploding stars, these supernovae, are like that. And it was the realization that this was the case um, that led people to met, look for these. So just go out and take pictures and look for these kinds of exploding stars. And then compare how uh, bright they are to how, how bright you know they are because they're all the same or very similar to each really? other. Really? All the exploding supernovae? It's, it, that's are... extreme simplification. So yeah. one type of supernova, the type that comes from a white dwarf star taking matter from its companion and reigniting and blowing up supernova type 1A. They happen when the star reaches a critical mass and they look very, all look very similar to each other. There are small differences which you can actually, by looking at nearby ones, figure out how to get them to equalize, shall we say. Um, and But they're so bright they outshine their host galaxies when they explode. So you can see them to extremely large distances. So by looking at, okay, there's a type 1A supernova. I know how bright it should be. I know how bright it looks. I get the distance. And by comparing that to how fast it seems to be moving away, which comes from the expansion of the universe, you can map the expansion history of the universe. And, but this is really, it sounds highfalutin, but really they're using an equation that I teach in Astronomy 101. That's the astronomy for people who aren't going to do science. And I tell people, look, this is this equation which you can all solve. You know, if you took a picture and measured this, and you know this number, you can get the distance. You can all do this math, and people want a Nobel Prize for this, right? And that's astronomy in its purest sense of going and taking observations data that lead you to something amazing. Well, speaking of which, uh, can, you, can you give us the track of his, of his talk? First, he was talking about, uh, you know, the Big Bang Theory, at least in his view, or I guess in the view of the majority of scientists. That's right. 
the vast uh, majority. Yes. Uh, okay, the vast majority, and then he then he he added the idea about inflation, mm -hmm. the expand expansion of the universe. Yeah, that uh, comes out of the Big Bang. Yep. Okay, and then he talked about uh, the multiverse, which is really really sexy stuff. <laughs> Could you give the track of it so people? Will I, I will try. Um, so. Maybe the easiest place to start is that the Big Bang Theory is a collection of different steps, basically, that outline how the universe that we know, that we understand, started, got bigger, and is continuing to get bigger today. And uh, we know the universe is expanding today because we can measure um, how fast galaxies are moving away from us. And the further away they are from us, the faster they seem to be moving. And this is a direct evidence for the expansion. If you were to do a numbers game of, uh, he had an, uh, an device that he used, it was a bunch of ping pong balls on a stretchy like rubber band. And if you're on any ping pong ball as you stretch the rubber band, the ping pong balls that are further away from you seem to move faster. But that's because every bit of space between the ping pong ball that you would be on and others is expanding. So that's what you get as an expanding universe. And we already knew the universe was expanding when Edwin Hubble, who the Hubble Space Telescope is named after, made these first observations of this uh, galaxy velocities in the early 20th century. So we've had about 100 years of knowing the universe is expanding. So if you think something is expanding today, then if you just rewind that, it must have been all smushed together at some point. So the Big Bang Theory comes out of that idea that at some point the universe was very compact, and then it expanded. And actually, I'd like to add, this is an example of, you know, interesting terminology. When this theory was first proposed, or early on in the days of these theories, many astronomers thought this was baloney. Many astronomers at the time favored what's called a static or steady state universe, where th the universe is, was, and always will be the same. So uh, they fought People, astronomers who kind of had that idea fought against this expanding universe Don't you idea. I love that when that happens in science. But that's science. That is science. So people <laughs> held out for that, and yet, in the end, the data, the observations won, and everyone had to give up on their steady state theory. Well, all but one or two astronomers who even some to this day have these ideas in their heads and try to come up with explanations. But you know, basically, science won out. The, the data just told you what the truth was. And even if you felt like it should have been steady state, you had to put that in the toilet and flush it. Okay? <laughs> you, take, you have to swallow your pride, right, that all the work you did. But anyway, so... Is the, is the expansion happening at a, at a steady rate, though? And assuming it, no. Or is it accelerating? It is accelerating. So the supernova results for which the 2011 Nobel Prize was awarded showed that today the expansion of the universe seems to be accelerating. And the way they discovered this was that if you look at how far an object is and how fast it's moving away from you, if you say, okay, well, if they've always been moving away this fast, then it should, and there's been this much time, then it should be this distance. Oh, but they look further away. That means that the expansion rate uh, must have been getting faster. So uh, you, you conclude that the expansion rate is changing. So that's due to something we call dark energy, which we don't understand. Um, but yeah, so the universe is expanding and it is expanding faster and faster, which is weird. If you think of normally of an explosion, and many people like to think of the Big Bang as an explosion, even though that's not what it was, it wasn't like a bomb going off. But usually, it happened over a long period of time. Well, however you define time. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, usually if you have something explodes, the material eventually slows down. In the case of the Big Bang, if the universe started expanding, but there's mass there, mass pulls on itself with gravity. So even if the stuff is moving apart, the gravity should be slowing down that expansion. And if there's enough mass, it slows down the expansion and makes it go back together. But what we see is that even though there's mass in the universe, it's going faster and faster, like someone is pumping it with energy to make it go faster and faster. And sort of like as space, as there gets more and more space, it gets more energy and goes even faster. And uh, this so actually, the gravity doesn't hold it back. The gravity doesn't hold it back. The gravity holds you and me to the, and everything in this room and all the, everyone watching to the Earth. It holds the Earth together. It holds our Milky Way galaxy together. It even holds clusters of galaxies together against the expansion. But the overall space is expanding. And it's expanding faster and faster. So the gravity is not winning. This dark energy is currently winning. And is that, we is that what dark energy means like vacuum? A well, vacuum of energy? 
Well, a vacuum means nothing, but yeah, some people think of it as an energy of the vacuum, that even empty space has in it some energy, some, something that we don't understand. A negative energy, maybe. Well, it's a positive energy because it's making things expand <laughs> faster. It actually has what's called a negative pressure, right? A negative e equation of state. If for a gas, right, the, if you're, as a gas expands, it gets less and less dense, so it applies less and less pressure. It, dark energy works like a gas, it's not a gas, but you can write mathematical equations that treat it that way, but instead of getting less and less strong as it expands, it gets more and more strong. And we do actually do not understand what it is, and that's why this accelerated expansion of the universe was really a head scratcher for astronomers, and it, the evidence seems inc incontrovertible now. It doesn't come just from these supernovae, but from observations of the cosmic microwave background and other things as well. So that, too, was a situation where it was the opposite of what astronomers thought. If you would have read a textbook in the 1990s, it would have talked about the acceleration. The universe will eventually slow down. And depending on how much mass there is, it will eventually slow down to an almost zero expansion or maybe recollapse. Today, we think the exact opposite. And that's OK for us to do that, because that's what the data tell us. Um, but What's the natural progression? What's the natural effect if it keeps on expanding at an accelerating rate? Is it going to come apart? There's no coming apart because what does it come apart into? It just gets larger and larger and things get further and further apart from each other and uh, the, the sad fate of the universe is to be cold with things very far apart from each other. There's not enough material at a high enough density to make any more new stars. The longest lived stars can live trillions of years, which is much longer than the current age of the universe. But if you want to worry about what's going to happen long after the Earth is gone and the sun is dead, you know, the universe will be a cold, cold, very, very empty place. I can see why you would want to solve this. You would want to know about dark energy. You would want to know about this process because it's there. Because you know a little, you have to know more. It's not just you have to know more. All these things, both dark energy and dark matter, which we see from its gravitational effects, they point to something is incomplete about our knowledge of physics. And whenever we learn something new about physics, we often find things that are amazing and applicable to our lives, uh, whether it's, you know, we develop wireless technology or computers or uh, medical things or whatever it is. There, new understanding leads to new things. If you want to be totally utilitarian, which I don't think is right, but many people look at it, so we need some utilitarian, something good has to come of it from, for the Earth or for humans. These new discoveries, you don't know what they're going to yield, but every time we've discovered some new physics, what, I mean, if you think of the time before um, Maxwell and the folks started to under, and Faraday started to understand electricity and magnetism, people couldn't harness that. Today, we're sitting here under lights, uh, broadcasting things via electromagnetic waves. That would have been impossible if people didn't discover, basically, that electricity and magnetism exist and work the way that they do. He talked about places where the rules of physics would be different? Yes. How did that happen? So he was talking, that's the multiverse. So we have our universe, and actually what we can observe from our universe is a tiny patch of our universe. Um, so just to, just to take a step back, our universe, uh, if, you, if you take a proton, so the very center of an atom, uh, is, is a tiny thing. Uh, to give people a sense of scale, a drop of water has 10 to the power 21 atoms in it. Okay, a one with 21 zeros after it. That's a big number, okay? And only a tiny fraction of that volume is the protons. Most of it is the electrons going around the protons. So you take that proton and you compare its size to the size of our observable universe. That's a ridiculous, it's a one with a lot of zeros after it. <laughs> that seems like, okay, it's an incomprehensibly large factor. Well, the size of the part of the universe that we can observe is probably tinier in comparison to the whole universe than a proton is to the size of the observable universe. So there's a lot of universe out there that we cannot observe because light simply has not had time to get to us from those parts of the universe. So that's amazing that we, what we can see, which has so much in it, is a tiny fraction of the observable universe. But it is quite possible, and in these models for the Big Bang that include inflation, which we, can talk, which we should talk about, you can have other universes being created that are totally disconnected in a causal sense, like things in those universes can't affect our universe, where the laws of physics are different. It could be that they have the same laws of physics, but the speed of light is a different number. 
All you'd have or, to do is have one thing different. Everything that's else right. will follow. That's right. So one example he gave in his talk was a lot, all the nuclear processes in stars that create the heavy elements rely on fusion of hydrogen to helium and helium into heavier elements. And that happens because the mass of the proton is a teeny bit different from the mass of the neutron. And that mass difference gets turned into energy uh, when protons convert into neutrons and, uh, or vice versa, and the, the energy is released. The, but if that mass difference was a lot bigger, then you couldn't have this exchange, and you would have no fusion, and you'd have no energy production mechanism, and no way to produce heavy elements, and you'd have a really boring universe with just hydrogen in it, for instance. <laughs> or if the mass difference was so tiny that they could go back and forth really easily, then you'd probably have a completely different way of making the elements, if you could even make it at all. So it's possible that our universe has complexity. He didn't really want to talk about life, but complexity, something more than just hydrogen in it. Um, because these physical constants, these things that we don't know why they have the value they have, but we just measure what they are, have those values and they allow chemistry to work. They allow our physics to work. And we know that if you change these values, which you could have in an other universe, that different stuff would arise or nothing would arise. So they're out there, though. I we mean, don't know. We have no way to... Oh, he was speculating. He was speculating. When he talked about multiple universes like or dislike our universe. That's correct. It's complete speculation, but um, it's an, a further step in what I like to call humans disassociating themselves from being the center of the universe. So early on, humans thought, oh, well, I'm the center of the universe. Then the Earth is the center of the universe. Then the solar system, the sun, is the center of the universe. Our Milky Way galaxy is the center of the universe. Now we realize that our part of the universe is not a special part. There's much more of it out there. And it could even be that there are other universes out there that are totally different from ours. And so our universe is just our one of many. And there may even be dimensions within our universe that we don't perceive. We, when we look at light, for instance, we see the colors of light that our eyes are sensitive to because that's mostly the colors that the sun gives off. But our eyes aren't sensitive to x-ray light, but it's there. Ultraviolet light, we feel it giving, I mean, we get sunburns from it, but we don't see it. Infrared light, we feel as heat from the sun, but we don't see it. So there's all these, and that's just all part of the same phenomenon, light, that we can build detectors to measure. What if there's stuff out there that our senses are completely incapable of seeing? In string theory, there are these other dimensions to the universe that are beyond the three dimensions of space and one dimension of time that we perceive in our reality. So he's saying, you know, we're, we're just stepping away from us being the definers of what is the universe and where we are in the universe. What about inflation? We only have a minute or two okay. left, but uh, tell us what inflation means in the context of the Big Bang Theory and multi-universe. So in the Big Bang Theory, uh, inflation is an integral part of it. The, in, in inflation, uh, basically right at the start of the universe, in the initial 10 to the minus 32 seconds or so, the universe undergoes a period of expansion that's faster than the speed of light. And this can happen because the physics of that time of the universe would be different. And this sounds crazy, but there's very important um, observational consequences to this, which we see. For instance, if I look over to that direction of the universe and that direction of the universe, statistically, they look the same. The microwave background radiation has the same temperature. There's the same tiny fluctuations in density. But that part of the universe and that part of the universe, in, if the universe was steadily expanding or even expanding at the rates we see from the dark energy, could never have talked to each other. They could never have had time to come into equilibrium. So that part could have any temperature, that part could have any temperature. Instead, what we see is everywhere is the same statistically. The only way that could be is if they had time, they were at some point able to communicate with each other and come into equilibrium. So we think that that was the case in the absolute very beginning of the universe, and then it underwent this ex super expansion phase that we call inflation, where the physics is different. And then it goes back to being like, or not back to, it goes into the state of the universe that we see the now. The expanding universe that the, we see now. The expansion rate that we see now, yeah. which is way s slower than the inflationary period. Well, you know, that you know, actually, you know, I was there. I didn't get that much of it. You've helped me yeah. a lot, Roy, to uh, understand it. And I, I have to say one last thought before we, we break here is that uh, I, was, I was so dazzled, so amazed at the end of the program uh, where Alex uh, Filipenko called for questions yep. and uh, half a dozen kids 
10, 12 years old, lined up to ask him questions. And they were really good questions. They understood everything. And, uh, and he made comments like, let's do a paper together. Yeah. You know, <laughs> because he wanted to be the first yeah. signature on the paper. But, um, you know, wh what is that about kids? Why, why do they have, uh, you know, this kind of abiding understanding in the, in the, in the, what is the, the expansion of the universe that, that I don't have, never will? I think there's uh, two things here. One is that children are natural curious. Uh, they are natural scientists, right? What does the child always ask the parent, why? And so that's all a scientist is ever doing. They ask why, they find an answer. But that answer is not satisfactory, so they ask why. Is it that the answer? What's the next step? And if you have children who uh, go to schools where that curiosity is nurtured, then they'll be scientists for life. And it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do science as a career, but they will always ask why. And that's an important question to ask in politics, in religion, in economics, in whatever, in your life. You Science is a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking. And these kids, I'm, I'm proud to say, actually, I think this is a great achievement for us. We see them at all of our talks. Many of them have come to, their parents bring them, their parents are incredibly supportive. Those kids are always asking questions. They're talking to us. They come before the talk and they're like, oh, I was reading this and that, and so they're questions. And we nurture that, and that's what we want to do. You know, six kids doesn't seem like a lot, but we don't have there's only one native Hawaiian astronomer, for instance. So if we can create a generation where that's normal to be a scientist and, and uh, be, you know, it's, it's a career path, then I think we can make a big difference for the state and the country. And so I'm, I'm proud that we are part of uh, what, you know, keeps these kids interested and hopefully turns them into, maybe they'll be the next Nobel Prize winners. That would be awesome. That's Roy Gao of IFA, inspiring guy. And he, he, he can explain what Alex uh, Filipenko was talking about. Maybe, a little bit. <laughs> this is Think Tech Talks. We're talking about our expanding understanding of our expanding universe. Thank you so much, Roy. Oh, thank you, Jane. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>